welcome to episode five of Kindred Sessions. My name is Bobby, and I produce the podcast. This week's episode is a continuation of a discussion on the book Blue Parakeet by Scott McKnight. We're going to dive right into the discussion with host Mike Mumford and returning guest Brandon Evans. Okay, so we're talking about what the Bible claims to be. Mm -hmm. We're talking about um, how having an understanding of of what the Bible is affects what we do with it and how we interact with it. I feel like, um, you know, those like uh, those like, uh, you know, crime movies where there's like a murder and they're like tracing the trajectory of the bullet back to the shooter's position and that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. That's kind of what I feel like we're doing, but like backwards and like we see the end of the story as it was written. And then it's our job to kind of like look down the sights of it and be like, okay, well this is the obvious conclusion. This is where we need to go. Yeah. And our job is to take it there. Right. Um, that's pretty controversial. I think a pretty controversial approach to the Bible. When I've talked to people, um, you know, um, from different traditions and stuff like that. Sometimes that's like, oh yeah, definitely. And sometimes it's like, no, right. You do not do that. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't understand why not. It seems so obvious to me, Yeah. you know? Um, and I think maybe, maybe one of the reasons why it can be really off putting is because of some of the common misconceptions about what the Bible actually is and, and mm-hmm. how that informs how, how we would yeah. engage with it. If we are looking at the Bible to be something that it isn't claiming to be. Right. And, and yeah, it's like Contra the Quran and the Book of Mormon. It's like it wasn't given all at one time or in a very short amount of time through one person. It was given in different ways at different times through different styles. And we just have to accept that. Like this is us letting the Bible be the Bible, as McKnight puts it. It's us letting God on his own terms define what he is going to communicate, when he's going to communicate it, how he's going to communicate it. And that's unsettling. Like it, I was an evangelical kid raised, and mm-hmm. it, you know, the Bible had a sense of of being sacred, and and yet it was monolithic. It was from start to finish. It was the same force, the same velocity of God's communication. And then when all the weird stuff happens in the Old Testament, and so you're just like, I don't know what to do with that. But pick and and hear that. Oh, that verse is really good. That verse is really good over there. That. Oh, I, I really like this this book or something. You know, it's like, and and we're then just taking the parts that we can we can stomach, rather than mm-hmm. saying maybe we shouldn't be the ones to determine what the Bible is. Hmm. Let the Bible speak, and and it will challenge us on a number of levels. I'm still getting challenged by things that even as we're having this conversation, like what do the biblical authors know? There was a time where I was like, they knew they knew everything because right. God is revealing the Bible through them, and now I'm like, no, they didn't. <laughs> they were humans, <laughs> right? I mean, Paul. Paul would be. Paul would probably be upset that there's Saint Paul cathedrals and things like yeah. honoring him. He would be like, "No, right." I, I mean, if you read Chief his of letters, sinners, you know, yeah, you know exactly. You read, you read his letters, and he always puts himself subordinate to the people he's writing to. Like he he does not have this, even though he is speaking on God's authority. He has the authority as an apostle. He isn't like you're going to honor me as Saint Paul. Sure. But then Christians throughout history have done that, and and I wonder if he would he would see that and be like, you guys didn't listen to what I said. You're not doing mm-hmm. what I said. Like, stop honoring me. Honor Jesus. Mm-hmm. And and he constantly re- rejected honor for himself because of Jesus. And and if we listen to him, we're like, yeah, that's. I remember reading Galatians the first time, and my thought was, Paul's a jerk. Because <laughs> I, as a kid, got maybe a couple of verses out of out of Galatians during Awana or something that I had to ingest and then puke out to whoever to get my Awana bucks, and then it was like that was it. But I'd never read the whole letter, and he is like so sharp with the Galatians in there, yeah. and I was struck by his personality, not even so much the content, but in in the first reading was just like he can talk like that to people. <laughs> <laughs> and he is not this nice. He didn't totally. sound like a Christian to me. Yeah, because he was so raw. Yeah, and I'm like, well, yeah, I shouldn't be importing onto him what I think he should sound like. I should listen to to him and what he's saying. Yeah, and figure out what to make of that. Yeah. So, what do you feel like are some of the the main like misconceptions about what the Bible is, and how does that impact, you know, some of the in- interpretive uh, processes and stuff like that? There's a number one one I think that is very common is treating the Bible like a puzzle. And Scott 
spends a good amount of time in the Blue Parakeet talking about this. And it is a common way we have been taught to read the Bible, where Mm -hmm. you look at specific prophecies and go, okay, this is referring to this future event. Skip over all the other prophecies that don't quite make sense. Oh, this other prophecy, this is referring to this future event. Okay, now if we put those together, now we got a picture of what the future's like. And it's us literally clipping out verses or sections of the Bible, putting it up on the board, drawing the connections and stuff. And, right. and I think like Isaiah and Ezekiel and people would be like, what the heck are you doing with my book? It's equivalent to us writing a letter to someone, having them circle a line in paragraph one and paragraph four, or paragraph 20, constructing something that we're not saying and then saying, well, you said it, said it all. It's yeah, like, well, right. no, read the whole thing the whole letter and I'm it's you're, you're kind of taking it out of context. Mm-hmm. It's almost like the, uh, like the way that uh, political articles are written these days for the news. You read, you read some article about, about Trump and he's like this terrible, just demon of a man. And then you go watch the actual press conference. It's like, well that, okay. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't right. that bad, you know, right. like I see what you're saying, but it wasn't like he said exactly what you're saying right, right. now, you know, and it, but obviously it's like for a different purpose, but right. it really does feel like, you know, like almost conspiracy level type you yeah. know, stuff. Like, you know, continuing the crime, uh, the crime drama TV show analogy, you know, when they have like the big cork board up with all the red strings all over the place. And, mm-hmm. and on the one hand, I feel like there is some of that legitimately in the Bible where there's like all these, you know, like hyperlinks from mm-hmm. one story to another and they're, they're legitimate hyperlinks, but there's also a way where you can do that and kind of take it too far. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's so in, in the, the Bible, especially the, the writers of the Bible, hyperlinking back to earlier stories is like they're building on a on levels. Mm-hmm. And so, if you have, say, in Revelation, talk of Gog and Magog, in 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 Revelation nineteen, then you, if you know the Bible, go, oh, that's Ezekiel thirty eight, mm. and you go back there and you read read the whole thing and you see that it's this Gog and Magog are what? They're towns or cities, Gog is right? the king of Magog and Magog okay. is referenced earlier in the Bible in Genesis but otherwise is a completely unknown place. Interesting. And John just like throws Gog and Magog in there and it's just <laughs> in in Revelation is like what are you talking about? And you have you would have no idea if you're just reading Revelation you'd be like I don't understand either of those words. <laughs> right. But it's linking back to Ezekiel 38. But the, then the question is, well, what is he doing with that chapter? Is he saying, well, okay, that was a prophecy that is then going to come fulfilled fully here? Or is he saying in in his reformulation of of what God's judgment is going to be like and, and this cosmic battle, l- linking back to Ezekiel 38 to just say it's it's like that, like mm-hmm. that was foreshadowing what is what is to come. And so there are all those t- interpretive questions you have to ask, but the Bible was not written with these random prophecies thrown all over the place that we're then to go try to discover just one here, one there, one there, piece it all together, and then create our theology out of it. Yeah. It, it is more well-rounded than that. It requires the whole context right. to, to even understand what the specific prophecies or, or events are, are actually addressing. Sure. And and one of the things that I thought stuck out to me was a while ago. I don't remember exactly where I heard it. It was probably Bible Project, to be honest, when they were going through their apocalyptic literature um, segment um, through their podcast. They were talking about how like um, the, like the book of Revelation is full of prophecies and visions and things like that. Um, But the first chapters tell you who it's written for. Mm-hmm. So these specific seven churches in Asia, mm-hmm. um, and it was a message to them. Mm-hmm. So if there's a bunch of content in the book of Revelation that does not apply to them, that would be un- illogical. You know, yeah. It would not make any sense. Like all the content in the book of Revelation applies to those seven churches. Yep. It, it may or may not apply to us, but it for sure applies to them. So mm-hmm. if there's stuff in the book of Revelation that's like, you know, oh, this is about Russia or China or stuff like that. It's like, well, maybe thematically it's about, you know, nations of the earth, but it was definitely about the nations of the earth at that time. Exactly. That's for sure. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So it was meant to be understood by them. Yeah. And they would have understood it. Yeah. And Revelation is a great example where 
if you know the Old Testament, the Old Testament is all over the place in Revelation. Sure. If you don't know the Old Testament, then a lot of it doesn't make sense. Right. But the early audience would have known their Old Testaments. Right. Everything One of the things that blows me away the, the, about that, that always, ever since I realized that particular, like, you know, way of, or no, I think it was Sam Storms that was talking about this stuff on a podcast. Anyway, um, uh, uh, was, you know, the whole mark of the beast and the 666 and it's on your head and it's on your hand and all this kind of stuff. It's like, well, the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter six yeah. is, is, you know, uh, there's an exhortation that you should, uh, wear, you know, the, the, the commandments on your head and on your hand. Mm-hmm. And it was like, you, we wear these as a front lip. It was like a, a, a what do you call a, like an analogy. You wear the commandments of God, like a front lip between your eyes and you wear it on your mm-hmm. hand and you talk about it with your children as you go along the way. And as you lie down and as you stand up, you're talking about this, you're praying through this. And then the mark of the beast is this thing that you wear on your head or on your hand. It's the anti Shema. Mm-hmm. And what is the Shema? The Lord your God is one, and you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And you know what I'm saying? It's like, so yeah. whoever doesn't love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, where's the anti Shema, which is the mark of the beast? Right. And I was just like, yeah. like, but that's what they immediately, when they think hand in head, they're yeah. like, oh, Shema. That's what they're talking about. Right. You know? That yeah. And, and, and so you can't understand what the mark of the beast is without understanding what the Shema was. Right. And it seems like a tall task for the average Christian reading the Bible to know all of that, but right. Oh, and just real quick for the listeners, the Shema was a it was a tra- it's a traditional uh, Jewish prayer, and the reason it, it, it starts with the word Shema in Hebrew, which is here, right? Mm-hmm. And the passage is from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter six, and it says, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with heart, soul, and strength." And continues on with a bunch of other stuff, but yeah. that's why it's called Shema. Anyway, just wanted to explain and. I think this brings us back to the larger point. It's like, what, how are we reading the Bible? And when you realize the layers to it, the depth of it, it's like, you can't just master it on one sitting. Yeah. You can't just master it on a, like an average Sunday attendance. You can't just master it in your community group Bible Mm -hmm. study or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, it is a lifetime of, of interacting with the Bible, either in study or just listening or having other people explaining. It's like, it is a community project. It is a lifelong project. I think a lot of our, you know, our criticisms of people like, how much are you in your Bible and stuff? It's like, maybe we just haven't equipped them to see that there are far more depths. Like you get to a point of satisfaction and you're done. Like you're not, it's just like, why, why keep going back? But if you realize, whoa, there's way more going on here than I had originally thought, you're going to want to explore that more and Mm -hmm. settle it. And Revelation is a good example to go back to the Shema and the Mark of the Beast is like, if you maybe thought it is a microchip that Bill Gates is going to give you through a vaccine. (laughs) And you're like, that's just how you, that's how you understand. Like, that's what the mark of the beast means. So you're not, okay, don't take that. And then someone's like, well, actually this is a subversion of what God has called his people to do. And that's worship him alone. And Mm -hmm. maybe worshiping the beast is something that, that is what it means to have the mark. And, and, and you're like, whoa, that changes the whole paradigm. And then, then you're like, okay, maybe I should go to Deuteronomy and read Deuteronomy. That had always been mm-hmm. a book that I never wanted to touch. And now right. I actually need to understand Deuteronomy to understand the mark of the beast. And, and in so doing, it's like you are, you are taking the Bible on its terms. You are encountering God through that, and you are being changed in the process. Yeah, and I feel, I feel like um, um, I want to be careful personally uh, to like pass judgment on that kind of interpretive process because it was definitely what I was taught. Yeah, me too. Immediately. Me too. It was like, welcome to Christianity. Here's what you do with this thing, Mm -hmm. you know? And it was from, it was a long time of like personal research research and study and kind of going, this doesn't quite make sense of everything that's here. Um, Which I think is, is kind of the point of, of Scott's book is that, um, you want to approach the Bible in a way that makes sense of all of it. Yes. Right. Um, and if your system of making sense of some of it does not make sense of all of it, your system needs to be revised. Yep. It's not the Bible that needs to be revised. Right. right? right. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's part of the deconstruction that I've even been going through the mm-hmm. last, you know, six months or a year. Or, I don't even know how long it's been, to be honest, yeah. <laughs> probably several years, if, you know, if I'm being realistic. But like part of that deconstruction is not necessarily like, 
oh, like, you know, people talk about deconstruction being like this, like, you know, breaking down of the Christian mm-hmm. faith. I'm not even sure if I believe this stuff anymore. That's not the case for me, at least. It's been like my system does not work. Yeah. It does not do justice to the book. Right. It does not make sense of everything that's right. in here. I need to figure this out. Um, and that was a process that started for me, like I yeah. said, a couple of years ago. And and after much, like, detective work, mm-hmm. finally kind of stumbled across, you know, Scott McKnight's work, the Bible Project's work, um, William Webb's work, um, uh, Tim Gombas's work. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's a, he's a really, really brilliant Pauline scholar. Um, and a lot of these people who are kind of like, on, oh, N.T. Wright's work is a really, really good scholar on this stuff too. And a lot of these guys that are on this on this wavelength of trying to to make sense of the Bible, yeah. you know, and not being satisfied with there being holes in yeah. the in the interpretation. And I think there is a scholarly explosion right now, where it's almost unsettling because there's so many voices out there. Like mm-hmm. you, you, you're like, what does justification mean? And there's 50 different people telling right. you now how it's all reshaped through. A, a contextual study of, of Paul's letters and stuff. And you're like, Oh my gosh, I just need a simple definition here. Sure. You know that it, it but we're, we're experiencing this explosion because I think we ran into some roadblocks where the Bible had been taken certain ways in, in maybe hyper literal would be a way to put it, or just treating it as a puzzle or just not sensitive to the context, whatever there. I mean, there've been people that have been better at it than others, but it just realizing we, we just can't handle certain things of the Bible and so the approach is not so much to dismiss them or try to explain them the way, but say maybe we just approach the Bible incorrectly. Like maybe we mm. we have been importing what we think the Bible should be doing rather than hearing from the Bible. And the scholarly mm. explosion in the last 30, 40 years has been evidence of that, I think, mm. where you have people that are like all, all of a sudden in new frontier in terms of re remodeling the biblical interpretive house. Mm-hmm. And and they're all like, no, I you know the closet actually should go over here, and the kitchen would make better sense over here, and people, like, no, 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 put the kitchen over there, and you know that kind of like, that's what what's going on right now because people have realized we need a remodeling mm-hmm. to actually be able to apply this today, mm-hmm. to be able to live it out today, and we're beneficiaries of that. Yeah, we get to see aspects of the Bible, and the Bible Project is so good at this in showing things that have been hiding in plain sight, where you're like, right. Man, even if I've been reading the Bible for years, like I just missed that, and it's been there the whole <laughs> yeah, time. Totally, and I never see that before. It's like, well, because t- Tim Mackey's a genius, that's why. <laughs> yeah, and that, and that to me is so invigorating because, I'm like, yeah, I don't want to get tired of the Bible, right? And I don't want to feel like, well, God said it, and I believe it, and that's it, and it's so simple because you just really can't do that, right? But to be at a perpetual participant in the the Bible. It, it is something where it's like it is. It is going to be better in the long run. Yeah. And I and I I even if I feel like it's not as simple as it once was, it's way more powerful than it once was. Mm-hmm. And I will take that over simplicity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like some of the the unhelpful ways that that we can kind of you know treat the Bible, like you said, a puzzle. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't work with what what content is actually there. I feel like a science book is typically one that I mm-hmm. hear sometimes. Like, you know, people will read Genesis and the creation account and they'll be like, oh, see, this is what, this is the Big Bang section right here. Right. And this is, you know, the, the second billion years of the universe's creation when when the stars are beginning to form and you know, when God's like mm-hmm. talking about the, the lights being made in the, in the sky and stuff. And I'm like, I'm like, th- that's not what they're talking about. That's right. not what the Bible is. Um, and I think Scott actually has in the index of blue parakeet, he talks about like a bunch of this stuff and like uh, concordism mm-hmm. and people reading the Bible and thinking, you know, if there's something that kind of sounds like a scientific reality today, yeah. that it must have been implanted kind of by the spirit. Yeah. Like if something seems to reflect quantum physics in the Psalms, then mm-hmm. it was because God was thinking about quantum physics right. when, you know what I was saying, yeah. when it was written. But that's just not, I mean, it's not what the Bible is. I mean, I, I guess I should say, I don't know for a fact that that's not what the Bible is, but that really doesn't seem to be what the Bible is. It really doesn't seem to be what the Bible <laughs> yeah. is. Right? Because then we're, we're putting... Our day and age, as pro- like we are, mm-hmm. we are at the top of the pyramid. But if Christ doesn't return for another thousand years, like our our scientific views are going to seem way outdated. Yeah, totally. And if we have then said, okay, 
Genesis is speaking about evolution in the terms that we understand, the epochs of crea- creation as we understand it, and then a thousand years from now, if science has taught us anything, it's that paradigms will shift and people will look at past mm-hmm. views and say, oh, how primitive they were. It's like if we've coupled the Bible with that, then guess what goes with that scientific theory? The Bible. The Bible. Yeah. As soon as you have to discredit some scientific theory, the Bible goes away. But if you take the Bible on its terms and look in its ancient Near Eastern context, how they understood the cosmos and Mm -hmm. what they cared more about, which was more why. Mm -hmm. Why are there things? What are we doing here? Those kinds of questions, not how did we get here and what Mm -hmm. were the mechanics of how God brought us here. When we see that they're more concerned with why, we're like, oh. We should be concerned with why, too. Mm -hmm. And Genesis still speaks to that. Mm -hmm. And they're not concerned with how God built the house, just how he's preparing the home and why he's preparing the home. Sure. And so we're like, okay, yeah, we live in this world, and God is doing something with it, and Genesis speaks to us today. Mm -hmm. If we want Genesis, though, to solve our debates on whether the earth is 6,000 years old or 6 billion years old, we're out of luck. Yeah, right. And and we're not hearing what God is actually saying through it. Right. I, I feel like another one, Just I'm just going to kind of breeze through a few of them that have been on my mind because um, we're getting pretty long on the episode and want to wrap it up soon. But um, another one is like, it's the good old days, mm-hmm. right? Like, because we because it's in the Bible, we got to get back to that somehow. Yeah. And, uh, oh, we got to get back to the Garden of Eden or we got to get back to, you know, um, Whatever, like the the you see it a lot in like um, patriotism, like that 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 the America is the nation, God's nation, we're God's country, and we got to get back to mm-hmm. the having the favor of God, like they like um like Israel did, like we're the modern Israel or whatever. Or you see it like uh, in the church, you know, is like well, the, the church today is just is just way too like um, what do you call it? like just too modernized. We got to go back to like Acts 2, right. man, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Like you hear that a lot. Yeah. Um, and I think that when you're looking at it from a, like a trajectorial perspective, mm-hmm. and you look back at it and you go, well, this is what was going on in Acts 2. And as I look down the sites, I can kind of see where it should go. And maybe yeah. that is not what we're experiencing. Maybe we are kind of straight off from that path. Um, that doesn't necessarily, I'm not saying one way or the other that we have or have not, but it's definitely not the reverse. Like we should right. go back to Acts two, or we should go back to the Garden of Eden, right. or we should go back to the, you know, the temple, you know, days in Jerusalem, or right. whatever. Um, so, what, thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I find that funny because if you're if you're of the opinion you want to go back to the early church because like that's where they got it right, <laughs> read the New Testament and see it's like they had so many problems that we don't want to deal with today. Yeah. I don't want to be talking about circumcision, whether or not we should be doing that, or like <laughs> whether or not we should eat food with blood in it and the meat with the blood in it, or, or food sacrificed to idols right. and things that they were like sparring over, yeah. dividing over, and yeah, it just is is like no God God had acted in history. The early church was forming. There was examples of the gospel being lived out, and Acts 2 is a good example of that. There were also examples where they had a long way to go. Mm -hmm. And so we can apply that same thing to us today. There are examples where the gospel is actually being lived out. There are examples where God's power is being shown, and we also have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. And so we're just in that same stream as they are. Mm -hmm. And we're looking forward to a day where the problems are gone, where God has acted again in in the return of Christ and the the recreation of all things, and it's forward looking. It's not. It's we look to the past to go, look at how far we've come and look at what God has been doing. But we're looking forward to what He is still going to do, mm-hmm. not trying to just get back yeah. to the idealized past. And that's one of the problems I have with. Um, and not to, I don't want to get overly political, but one of the problems I have with. Um, I guess this episode will be airing after the election, so we'll know if the <laughs> president, if the if Donald Trump's the president still. But um, one of the things that one of the problems I have with that his phrase "Make America Great Again" is it's a looking back, you know. Um, and uh, it, it, like f- as a Christian, we're looking forward to the the kingdom yeah. coming, not looking back on what we used to have. And yeah. that's kind of like the Christian uh, perspective. And that, that's not necessarily a comment on his like policies or politics, but mm-hmm. from a from a conceptual standpoint, like the good old days, the glory days, trying to get back to what we had is yeah. kind of like anti-Christian in a way. Right. Is like the Christian, you know, uh, like perspective throughout the the scripture is looking forward to the coming kingdom. Right. Not to try to return to something that we once had. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If the Bible shows us anything, it's that the past is not idealized. Yeah. And we're not trying to get back to the past. Even Eden, as as 
pristine as it, it, it appears on the pages of Genesis 1 and 2. It's a garden. Mm-hmm. And we are progressing to a, a city, a, a global community. It's right. like it, we are far transcending a life in a garden eating fresh fruit. You're saying according to Revelation. Yeah, according to yeah. like the whole Bible's trajectory where it's like we saw in Eden patterns that, that, that are established. Mm-hmm. But our goal is not to go back to Eden. And, and that's not where God has taken us. Right. He's taken us somewhere far better. And Eden is, is but a shadow of that. Yeah. And so our posture as Christians is learn from the past, be reminded of the past, have it inform our present in terms of our faithfulness. But we have our eye on the future because God is a God who has shown in the past that he acts faithfully and he's going to do it again. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that gives us confidence, especially when we face currently in America, many uncertain things. It's like we, we can actually go, uh, God, I don't know what you're doing here, but I know what you're ultimately going to do. Mm-hmm. And, that, and I can really refresh our souls and yeah. give us a sense of hope. Yeah. And then the last one that I was thinking about is like w- a lot of times we use the Bible as like a behavior manual. Yeah. Where it's like, you know, if we just understood this thing, we could finally do it right. Right. You know, and I, I'm not sure if the Bible... F- claims to even be that you know one of the things that i um uh was listening to one of tim Mackey's podcasts about the law it was a long time ago which it, you know if you're uh, listening to this podcast um, i highly suggest listening to the bible projects podcast and going back to the law series it was absolutely fantastic um but one of the things he talks about is how there are like 611 laws in the torah but the word torah it if you like, because, you know, in, in Hebrew, the letters are also numbers, like in Roman numerals, kind of. Is that correct? Sort of? Yeah. Well, yeah, they, they would have a number corresponding to them. Yeah. yeah. So, like, um, so, like, the word Torah also equals 611. Like, if you read it as a number versus just a word. And so it's like, did they call it Torah because there's 611 word uh, laws in the Torah? Or... Did they only include 611 laws because it's called Torah? And Torah means instruction, not law. We That's take true. it. We take it as you know, it's law, and it is God's instruction for how to live, and and that is different. Instruction and law are, are different things, right? But my my thinking about that is like, if if they only included 611, like as a thematic gesture toward mm-hmm. the word t- instruction. Um, then were there are were there laws that were not included? Were there more than six hundred and eleven that they lived by, but were they only included six hundred and eleven to tell the story of the you know of that part of the of God's yeah. uh, you know redemptive history or whatever? I don't know. Um, but that's always struck me as something where I'm like, I'm like this this is a coincidence that is either just highly coincidental, mm-hmm. there just happens to be six hundred and eleven right. laws, which happens to match the word Torah in in Hebrew. Um, or they named it Torah after the number 611 because that's how many laws they had. Like I'm trying to piece together why it is that. But what I think is most likely is that it was um, it was they included 611 because that's the number of the word, um, which I know I'm just kind of getting off into a rabbit trail here. But I'm trying to lock it in is that is that um, the uh, Torah in the Old Testament was not exhaustive. It wasn't everything that you had to know. And if you just had it all, you could do it all right. Right. It was telling the, the story of God's redemptive history through that period of time. Right. Um, and then also the same thing moving forward into the new Testament is, is the commandments um, or the commands, I should say that I keep saying that the commands that, that you see in the new Testament are not the only things you should consider. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're uh, not everything you should consider right. either. You know what I'm saying? It's like, uh, it's um, it's helpful, instructive, but it's not like follow the rules and you will, yeah. you know, you'll do it right. Where the Proverbs do say, like, if you, you know, live by the Torah, then things will go well for you, which right. is true. Um, but it's not an exhaustive list of all the behaviors that a Christian should exhibit. And we know that because you don't just get a comprehensive list all together where it's right. like, here is your your to-do list. Mm-hmm. Or your to be list, mm-hmm. you don't get a comprehensive one. It's like even in the Torah, it's Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy contain 
differences and pieces of it. It's like those 611 or 613, depending on there's debate as to whether or not it's 611 or 613. It's like they're not all in one place. They're, they're scattered throughout these different books. New Testament, too, is like Paul is adding things that Jesus didn't say. And if Jesus wanted us to have a laundry list of behaviors, he would have just outright said that. Mm-hmm. We I mean, he, I mean, he kind of did on the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> well, he gives, but that's his, that's his retelling of the Torah, his fulfillment of the Torah. is like, this is what the Torah, this is a new Torah. He is a new Moses with a new Torah. And even then he doesn't include all of the Torah that's true. in there. And it's like, he didn't just go, all right, the 10 commandments, I'm going to go each one. And here you go. Here's your new, new terms. Mm-hmm. It's like, he does it. He, he mixes them together and, and doesn't include the full list and, and so we're like, well, what's he doing here? Yeah. Is he is he giving us the vision for how we're to live as his people? Yes. Hmm. Is it boiled down to law in terms of prescriptive things that we have to do that are spelled out? Like our, our modern legal system is like, sure, y- you have to spell everything out right. to be able to have in court the ability to say this person broke the law. And biblical commands don't don't always work like that. Some, some do, but not, not always. Yeah. That was one of the things that blew me away about, about the law uh, series that Bible project did was that the, the way of doing law that we have as a modern society is fairly new. Mm-hmm. It's not an, a concept that the ancient writers of the Bible would have been familiar with the, the way that laws worked. It was like you had judges that just decided whether they thought this was right or wrong. Yeah. And the thing that made a judge, uh, um, like qualified is that they're a person of good character, you know, and mm-hmm. that they, they lived, you know, according to the teachings and like there was fruitfulness in their life and that kind of stuff, because, you know, they can make good decisions, but they weren't like, v- like scholars of the law necessarily. Like mm-hmm. they weren't like, Oh, well it says in this passage, this, but it also says in this passage, this, so there's a combination here. It was just kind of like they would, they just had a good sense of judgment and you would just take your stuff to them and they'd be like, well, I think he's right. <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, because that whole concept of how law works is new. Mm-hmm. It's very new to like modern society. But then some did in, in Jesus's day, he's encountering the religious leaders who true. had de- defined it and, and were holding to very particular, particular aspects of it, you know, tithe your mint and dill and cumin. Right. Oh, and yeah. Jesus, what Jesus points out is like, all right, you guys have taken what the Torah has said and you have codified it. You have, you have defined it. You have even added things to it. And he's like, and you've forgotten the whole point of it. <laughs> and it's like, how much more do we do that? Where we're, we're, we're going to define certain things and then we're going to, we're going to then clarify those things and we're going to build a whole law and we'd be like, well, encountering Jesus, oh, we've forgotten the love portion of this, hmm. which he was very clear on, or right. the justice portion on this, right. which he was very clear on. And it's like, yeah, we get checked constantly, and and the solution is going back to the Bible and hearing from God through the Bible and challenging the things that we may have constructed that are not of him. Mm-hmm. And this is a lifelong process mm-hmm. as a community to do this. Mm-hmm. So the Bible is not a behavior manual, though it informs how we should behave, correct? Yeah. The Bible is not a science book, though it informs the scientific beliefs of the people at the time that wrote it. It reflects those things. It reflects them. Yeah. And it even helps us today navigate science and what, what its role is in our life and and what we're to ultimately think about it. Mm-hmm. And the Bible's not a puzzle, though... It's um, puzzling. It's puzzling. <laughs> Yeah, so um, what is this book anyway? It is God's grand narrative. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I don't yeah. know, you know, like, I don't know how far we've flown away from the blue parakeet in this. I feel like we've stayed pretty close. Yeah. But what, what this has done and why I think it's good that we're talking about the blue parakeet and what Scott McKnight talks about the Bible in, in, in the book through it is it just unlocks so much. And we, and we cannot exhaust the depths of it mm-hmm. if we take it on its terms mm-hmm. and, and hear from God through it. And we could have podcasts totaling the rest of our lives talking about things that are coming out of it just because it is such a treasure trove. Mm. And sometimes if we feel stuck, we may just have to zoom out a bit and say, have we just approached this incorrectly? Mm. And that I think we continually have to do. Yeah, that's good. Let's take a quick break and then we're just going to close it out with some final thoughts.
All right. So let's let's bring it home, shall we? Closing thoughts. Um, I think it'd be good for us to just um, kind of wrap things up with. We've discussed, you know, what what the Bible is, what it isn't. Um, we've discussed how God spoke, you know, through using using different people and speaking in different ways, and that kind of being um, what th- those are the words that the Bible records. Um, but I think you know, the last thing we should touch on is, um, what do we do with it? Mm -hmm. You know, now knowing what it is and what it isn't, what, um, what should we do? Here. Shema. (laughs) Okay. Just, I mean, if we have to sum it up, if God is speaking truly through this collection of books, our, our job is to listen. Okay. We have the modern advantage of being literate. I'm assuming most all readers and and listeners of this podcast are literate. Mm -hmm. I I think we, in hearing from God, have this advantage to be able to access the Bible on our own. This is part of our Protestant tradition where it's like the Bible got into the hands of the everyday person. Mm -hmm. It's not in the hands of the specialists. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do with it? We get into it. We hear from God and we check ourselves in light of the Bible, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I forget um, who, I think it was like during the Reformation, Luther and Calvin, those guys talking about how the Bible, you know, there's like a word for it. There's like a term for it, how it could be understood by the lay person. The perspicuity of scripture. Perspicuity of scripture. See, that's why I didn't remember the word. (laughs) It's a $5 (laughs) word. Um, Anyway, the perspicuity of of scripture. And I'm like, I don't know, guys. Like, have you read it? It's pretty crazy, man. (laughs) It's pretty tough to track with with what's all going on here. Like, I do see that if you just read the scripture, you just read specifically if you read the gospels, mm-hmm. it's like it's like, yeah, okay, I kind of get the I yeah. get the main story here. Um, um but man, it there is so much stuff that like I'm still kind of like what you're talking about. I mean, I'm still discovering just like mm-hmm. like every time I dig my hands in this thing, I'm just like pulling up stuff I've never even thought of before. Mm-hmm. Um and it's amazing. So to hear it, I guess. Yeah. You know, um, I was thinking about uh, Romans chapter 12, which is the the section, you know, when Paul says to the Roman church, he says, um, you know, I want you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That's your spiritual act of worship. Um, and that's like one of those verses that goes on like mugs and bumper stickers. And it's like one of the worship leader verses. You know, mm-hmm. everyone knows that one. Um, but... Verse three, I think it is, says, you know, kind of concludes it with why he wants you to do that. And it's that so that you will be able to discern what is the will of God. Yeah. You know, and if like, if the Bible was um, exhaustive in God's will, then he would have, he wouldn't have said to discern what the will of God is. He would have said, just read your Bible, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like go just read your Bible, figure out what you're supposed to do, Um, which is it's not that you don't read your Bible. It's not that your Bible does, does not inform your decision-making or does not inform your perspectives, but it's that um, uh, you still have to discern moving right. forward, right? You still have to look down the barrel sort of, of mm-hmm. where the Bible was going and discern what you're supposed to do next. Yeah. You know, you're um, supposed to live it out. Right. In, in ways in which the Bible just was not directly speaking to. Right. Our, our upcoming election is just not in the Bible. You can't yeah. look to the Bible to get the answers, right. but in being transformed by the renewal of your mind, like it says in Romans 12, sure. we can then look at our upcoming election and go, I have a new lens through which to see this. Mm-hmm. And that's the point is that we are living it out in our context, which. So, you know, the Bible being a story, a movement from the beginning to the end, you know, um, I feel like there. I feel like every time, uh, you know, you get to a new kind of iteration and generation of of the covenant people of God, you know, whether it's uh, you know Adam and Noah and Abraham and you know the the kingdoms and the kings and then the church and there's it's it's really a re- repeating of stories. Like you see Abraham make the same mistakes that Noah did, and you see David make the same mistakes that. 
Abraham did, and you see Moses make the same mistakes, you know, and uh, that Abraham did, and and you just see these these kind of like repeating things, mm-hmm. um, which leads me to believe that there is a basic story, a fundamental story, mm-hmm. right? What is that fundamental story? Because I've been wrestling with that, and I'm not sure. I have an yeah. idea, you know, uh, that it's it's. You know, it's the redemptive, the redemptive history. It's, you know, God makes humans, humans. And this is like, you know, one of the things that, that uh, I was taught, you know, really early in my pastoral training. It's like, oh, redemption, fall, create, or no, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Like, yeah. that's what it is, you know, um, which is true. But I feel like um, that is like the story arc of the whole Bible, yeah. but not like the, the cyclical story. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, because the creation, fall, redemption, restoration is a helpful grid, but it cuts out most of the Bible. It's like, <laughs> you know, true. It's, it's like, like you, you get, you get yeah. creation, fall in the first three chapters, yeah. and then redemption in Jesus, and then restoration at the end. Yeah. It's like, what do you do with the most of it? Like, yeah, yeah, right. The other 98.5%. So it's, it's, that's like the stick figure drawing of the sure. Bible, of which if you have then more a fuller picture of the trajectory and all that. But if there's a repeating pattern, it's God has created us to dwell with us. Hmm. we have rebelled against him and that is that is the essence of sin is just in a turning from him and worshiping the things of this world but god isn't going to leave us there he he wants that eternal relationship mm-hmm. and so he throughout the bible has established that where it's he's dwelling in a tent and then he's dwelling in a temple and then surprise jesus is the the true tabernacle he's right. the true temple he is than the one that has bridged God and man. And then now through Jesus, we're part of this temple where we are together with God. And we, even though we still have our, our failings and our, and our, our rebellions and, and there's separation from that, God is not ending the story there. He is going to ultimately dwell with us in his full presence. And we as his creatures get to experience that. Hmm. So it's kind of like, the dwelling place of God, if you would, if you would summarize it as the cyclical story is God figuring out how to dwell with us. Yeah. I will be your God and you will be my people. Yeah. The tripartite promise, right. Is the, the theological word for that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like, and that I feel like is also some of where where the stuff in Daniel comes into play, where you know, G, like God is elevating this son of man, this this human figure, to be a ruler with him, and how when he creates Adam and Eve, he uh, creates them and tasks them to be rulers of the earth, um, you know, and uh, uh, be, having that dwelling place where God and humans are in union, mm-hmm. like in union in union together, so. Then I think keeping that story, that cyclical story in mind as we interpret all the scripture, what does it look like to dwell with God, right? When we read Paul's command, commands in the New Testament, what does it look like to dwell with God in light of how is Paul trying to get us to dwell with God through these commands? And does that help us dwell with God now? Yeah. How is Moses trying to get us to dwell with God in his commandments? And does that help us dwell with God now? Yeah. And I don't know, man. I feel like that's kind of scandalous. Like yeah. if you're like, that actually doesn't help us dwell with God anymore. Like, who gets to be the judge of that? Yeah. Yeah, I think certain prayers throughout history and stuff is like, we don't really pray that way anymore. Or kosher eating and, and things like that. It's like, that's that's not part of our practice anymore. But we still dwell with God through obeying his commandments. As Jesus mm-hmm. said, you know, abide in me and I in you. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And mm-hmm. his commandments... Love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And it's like in doing that, we are actually connected to God and dwelling with him. And how do we go about doing that? And that's in part what the Bible informs us in, and mm-hmm. another part we are we are learning to apply in yeah. ways that maybe go beyond the Bible. That's what I really feel like is, it's like a tightrope, you know, where you're like, you're like, trying to read this thing and have it be authoritative in your life, but also discern what you're supposed to do in light of it. And also try to figure out what's not helpful anymore 
you know, like Rob was talking about the head coverings thing. Like we obviously don't do that. Or Paul says, you know, to greet each other with a holy kiss. I haven't kissed anybody at church except for my wife. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that's a good thing. And we're not going to be doing that for a very, very, very <laughs> long time. Especially because of COVID, right? <laughs> right. Um, but like, yeah. And it's like, so what things do I continue to do? What things don't I continue to do? How do I dwell with God? And how am I just taking this thing, you know, and trying to 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 do to do the right stuff? And it just really feels like, you know, disequilibrating sometimes. Yeah. And how to figure that out. But um, that's the challenge, I guess, right? And that's why we have to keep going back to the Bible and, and communion with God. Is like we don't get to just master it and then move on. Right. It is, a, it is a lifelong process in connection with him, and the Bible is a means through which he connects with us. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Well, um, that's going to conclude our episode for today. Get some music going. Um, thanks for joining us, for listening and following along. I know it was a, a long discussion, but I think it was good and it was fruitful. Um, that was our uh, review of The Blue Parakeet by Scott McKnight. If you haven't read it yet, go and pick it up. Um, fantastic, fantastic book. Um, we are going to be having another episode on this book talking specifically about women in ministry and, and Scott's treatment of that in The Blue Parakeet. Um, we are going to continue to do um, uh, book discussions on the podcast. The next book that we're going to tackle is called Jesus and John Wayne, mm -hmm. How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation, which is a gut punch of a title, I, I tell you. I was like, well, okay, thanks, lady. But um, Dr. Kristen Dumay, uh, she's, uh, she's the author. She's brilliant. She does a really good job just kind of um, following the culture of evangelicalism along with the c culture of uh, conservative politics. Um, and so it's bound to be a controversial discussion, but I think one that's helpful to have, especially because we're just entrenched in that culture if we're involved in evangelical church world. So looking forward to that. Go ahead and pick that up. Again, it's Jesus and John Wayne by Dr. Kristen Cobes Dumay, I think is how you pronounce her name. And uh, thanks again for just following along with us today. Um, we'll see you next time. If you enjoy the podcast, the easiest way to support us is to share it with a friend or rate us five stars on iTunes. If you'd like to sponsor the podcast, please email us at kindredsessionspodcast at gmail.com. Until next time.